We're here to talk about the book March. Uh, and with me are the three gentlemen responsible for it. Uh, at the end, Nate Powell, Eisner winner, Ignatz winner, Los Angeles Times Book Prize finalist. And uh, well, if you've read March, you probably need some room on that shelf. Andrew Aiden, uh, longtime congressional aide, uh, noted published uh, scholar of comics, uh, March is his first graphic novel. And uh, well, since we only have about 50 minutes, uh, the gentleman to my immediate right, uh, the Honorable John Lewis. Well, Congressman, thank you for joining us. Well, thank you very much for having us. Um, I mean, this year is the, the 50th anniversary of the March for Jobs and Freedom, which is not the march uh, discussed in the title. Um, but it's given us all the chance to talk about and hear about what went on then. Um, it's given the opportunity for people like Bayard Rustin, for example, to receive some of the acclaim and notice that he never did in life. Um, but I was wondering if you could talk about uh, one of the other organizers of the march, uh, who I know you were a great admirer of for many years and got to know, uh, A. Philip Randolph. Well, I'd be very uh, happy and pleased to speak about A. Philip Randolph. Uh, A. Philip Randolph was born in Jacksonville, Florida, um, moved to New York City, and became an organizer for labor and a champion of civil rights and human rights. He organized something called a Brotherhood of Sleeping Car Porters to represent the men uh, working on the railroad. He uh, always dreamed of having a march on Washington. Uh, he threatened uh, President Roosevelt with a march back in uh, uh, 1941. He, uh, was this unbelievable guy. I've always said that if he had been born maybe at another time, on another continent, maybe in another country, he probably would have been president, the prime minister or something. Uh, in some of those meetings where we would meet, he would always say something like, brethren, if you cannot say something good about someone, don't say anything. <laughs> and I, re I got to know him very, very well. Uh, 50 years ago, the first meeting we had with President Kennedy in June of 1963, back then I was only 23 years old, had all of my hair and a few pounds lighter. <laughs> in that meeting, he told President Kennedy, he said in his baritone voice, he said, Mr. President, the blank monsters are restless and we're going to march on Washington. Now, 1963 was a year when there had been so much activity, so much action in the movement, the Birmingham movement, where Bull Connor had used dogs and fire hoses. Um, Martin Luther King Jr. had been arrested and taken to jail, and he wrote the letter from the Birmingham jail. Mega Everest had been assassinated in Mississippi, and President Kennedy had invited us to the White House, and, but he didn't like the idea of a march on Washington. He said, Mr. Randolph, if you bring all these people to Washington, won't there be violence and chaos and disorder, and we'll never get a civil rights bill through the Congress. Mr. Randolph spoke up again and said, Mr. President, this will be an orderly, peaceful, nonviolent protest. And President Kennedy sort of rocked in this rocking chair and turned, said, I think we're going to have problems. We left that meeting with President Kennedy. We came out on the lawn at the White House, and Mr. Randolph was our spokesperson. He was the dean of like leadership. And he said we had a meaningful and productive meeting with the president. We told him we were going to march on Washington. <laughs> and that was it. And a few days later, we met in New York City at the old Roosevelt Hotel, the six of us, including Martin Luther King Jr., James Farmer, of course, Roy Wilkins of the NACP, and Whitney Young. And in that meeting, we invited four major white religious and labor leaders to join us in organizing and calling for the March on Washington. And the rest is history. And 
it was Ms. Arenda who presided over that unbelievable program the day of the march. And I remember when he introduced me, he said, I now present to you young John Lewis, the national chairman of the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee. And I spoke. And when it came time to introduce Dr. King, he said, I now present to you the moral leader of America, Martin Luther King, J.R. <laughs> yeah. That was it. And when the march was all over, President Kennedy invited us back down to the White House, and he stood in the door of the Oval Office, greeting each one of us, saying, you did a good job, you did a good job. He was beaming like a proud father. And when he got to Dr. King, he said, and you had a dream. That was my last time seeing President Kennedy, because on November 22nd, he was assassinated. So the book march tell the whole story of the march, and the books to come would tell the story, not just of the sit-ins, but we tell some of that in, in this book, book one, but in book two and book three, we tell the whole story of my life growing up in rural Alabama, coming through the march on Washington, the sit-ins, the Freedom Ride, the march from Selma to Montgomery. And these two young men here, Andrew and Nate, uh, they make it real. I mean, Andrew, you've, you've spent years uh, working for the congressman. Um, is part of writing this book just deciding which of these stories cannot fit into the book? Um, <clears throat> you know, the, the congressman tells these stories to the kids, right? And so you sort of, um, you see the way their eyes light up, and you see how they get excited, and you see um, where they take inspiration. And so uh, when we try and put it together, it's very much in this oral history, uh, in this oral tradition. Um, and so it's, it's, I think part of the reason it became a trilogy is because there's, there's, there's no way you can cut, right? I mean, y you have to tell it the way it is. You, you have to to give the, the, the good and the bad, the ins and the outs. Um, because when you're telling a history, um, everybody's contribution is important. Um, sometimes maybe what I think makes this project a little special is that we don't gloss over things. You know, you, you try really hard to tell uh, everything you can in the space you have. And then Nate brings that to a whole nother level with, with the way that he can depict the scenes. Because, Nate, I was going to bring that up because, uh, I mean, the book, obviously, uh, well, I'll use the comparison. Like Mouse, it gets a lot of attention because of the subject matter. Um, but like Mouse, it also requires art and a, a skill with the language of comics. Um, and, and talk a little about just trying to use your own uh, skill and your own uh, approach to comics in telling the story? Uh, sure. Um, <clears throat> I guess there were, there were a series of steps. You know, when I received the script from my cohorts and uh, I sort of uh, immediately, uh, you know, the first step was breaking it down in terms of determining what the actual pace of the book was. And uh, originally the book was a single, maybe 160 page graphic novel. Um, and uh, yeah, basically, within a week or so, I realized we were dealing with an epic. Um, but in, term, yeah, in terms of decision making and uh, trying to, I guess, trying to find where my responsibility was on in the narrative chain, uh, a lot of it had to do with first, you know, like I spend my life kind of, you know, like living and breathing comics, and uh, you know most of us in this room, but then also most people from my generation and all, even the generation prior, you know, we've grown up with enough general literacy about comics, not just as a, as a medium, as a form, but comics itself as a language that we're able to sort of take for granted some of the, some of the tools the, and the semiotic methods and the narrative tricks that allow comics to be not just a union of words and pictures, but its own language. This is the kind of thing that I take for granted because that's that's the air that I breathe, and uh, 
so very quickly, you know, when I was when I was trying to determine what parts of the script or captions or descriptions I should maybe send back to the writing half to you know consider for deletion because you know we were wanting to avoid being redundant as you know as comics try to do with words and images. Uh, then it made me realize that you know with the potential scope of a project like this, you're also also you're also trying to find the balance between. Uh, utilizing comics to its fullest with a comics literate uh, cross-section of people, but also making comic storytelling uh, readable, but also saturated with information, very descriptive and rich, uh, in a way that people who did not grow up with full comics literacy, uh, you know, giving them the ability to absorb it as immediately as possible. So there, I feel like, it was it was an unexpected challenge uh, in that you know like there are a lot of a lot of moments in book one that involve a lot of internal and emotional landscapes, particularly Congressman Lewis is a young person, and with a lot of those, I was able to kind of fall back on uh, my own you know memory of senses and and my own my own way of seeing my environment growing up as a kid in Alabama, and a lot of that was very intuitive. Um, but then also trying to figure out where the line was between the kind of like weirdo intuitive comics that I normally write and draw and then making sure that everything is serving a purpose to convey information or to, uh, you know, to further a sense of humanity to all the characters. But it was just something I never, I never directly considered audience in a comic that I've ever done before. And so it was a, a unique responsibility for this book. I mean, in that sense, considering the audience, was that sort of the big challenge, trying to find the right way to, to present all the information? No, really, it was just, all it took was realizing that that was a consideration. Uh, and it, it didn't really cause too many speed bumps or too much anxiety. A lot, and a lot of it also was, you know, I was born in the late 70s in the South. My parents were baby boomers, and so I grew up with a, you know, a basic but fairly complete understanding of the civil rights movement in general. And uh, the next hurdle was then realizing that, you know, I'm 35 now, and so there are 25-year-olds, 20-year-olds, 13-year-olds, not to mention who didn't grow up in the South, but uh, that a lot of the basic knowledge that w was stuff I was taking for granted, uh, that caused a little bit more, you know, pause and consideration than uh, the storytelling issues themselves. Now, um, Congressman, I am curious if any of your colleagues, um, when they're actually, because they, they don't seem to be doing much work generally, but, <laughs> but given that, have they had the opportunity to read it and talk to you about it? Well, several of, of my colleagues uh, write about uh, the point uh, <laughs> that we're not doing too much work. Uh, that remind me of the, when I was growing up, and I think both uh, Andrew and, and Nate been able to capture this very well. When I was growing up on that farm in rural Alabama, working in the field, uh, I would tell my mother, I said, this is hard work, this is very hard work, and this work is about to kill me. And she said, boy, hard work never killed anybody. I said, well, it's killing me. <laughs> and. Uh, so as, as, a, as, as a kid, I would hide under the house, and under the porch, and wait for the school bus to come along and uh, run out. When I heard the bus coming up the hill with my book bag and get on the bus and go out. And so some of my colleagues asked me about the book. Some of my colleagues are reading the book. And one or two heard a story, I believe, on NPR about the book. And one said to me just this past week, so my wife just wants your book. She heard about it, and I got to get a copy. And so several people have been asking me for a copy, and I've been trying to send a nice way. Uh, <laughs> you know, you can get it at uh, certain stores. You know, it's <laughs> available. I, I don't, you know, I, you know. 
so uh, I don't, uh, we just don't go out, you know, it's 435 members of the house and 100, that's a lot of books. That's a lot, that's a lot, that's a lot of books. Uh, it is my hope that all members of the House and Senate will have an opportunity uh, to read the book um, because I think, especially some of the younger members in the House and some in the Senate, uh, can learn a great deal, uh, like young people today uh, and people not so young can learn about that, that period. I mean, Andrew, you, you jo we joked around that uh, you caught flack from some of your colleagues for being a comics fan. Well, it's sort of, uh, it's not one of those things that you admit professionally. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, it, it takes a bit of bravery. Uh, but, you know, now it's funny because I guess in some weird way I found myself being the comic book guy on the hill. <laughs> And uh, so everybody wants to tell me now that they're fans of comics. And um, so, so we've always joked, you know, that there should be like a comic book club because everybody's out now, you know, we can be free about it. <laughs> and uh, you'd be surprised. I mean, really, um, like Jake Tapper over at CNN, he came in, we were doing an interview there and like totally geeked out on the congressman and the comic. Um, just all sorts of people, right? So now we're, now we can be open about this. There's no reason to be ashamed. You know, we can take it out from under the rug and, and everything like that. Let your action figures sit on your desk. Um, In the packaging. Right? Don't bend the corners. Um, so, you know, it's, been f it's actually really fun and liberating to be that guy, you know? Like, I can just let it fly. It's great. Um, but I think it, it also says something. You know, there's a distance traveled through this project. Um, it was Congress that, in many ways, did in comic books in 1954, um, and then the 50s and, and the subsequent aftermath of the hearings. And in all seriousness, this ruined people's lives. You know, th this was not something that was casual. Congress wields an enormous amount of power with its bully pulpit, and what they did in some respects to me was unforgivable because they saw it as a political opportunity for themselves. I mean, Estes Kefaufer, who was the second chairman of the Subcommittee on Juvenile Delinquency, um, who held these hearings, they, they, they were, and the first chairman, in fact, I mean, they, they were looking at this as a political advantage at the height of McCarthyism where everybody was looking for some sort of scourge to blame things on. But really what you were seeing was the ramifications from, from a world war. Young people were coming, to, coming of age seeing uh, they're, they're the older generation having been mutilated by the bombs and the bullets um, and th there was more violence in America because you had more people back here, there was, the war effort was over um, and people needed a scapegoat. They needed someone to blame because they didn't want to take responsibility for themselves and for, for the community that they'd created. And so uh, Congress used comic books along with some of these family research groups uh, as their scapegoat and ruin the creative lives of individuals who today I think, you know, we can look back on as, as giving a substantive contribution. Um, and that sucked. <laughs> I mean, that was awful, you know? And, and for us, and I, I mean, I guess I see this from the other side, you know, on the staffer side where um, we have an opportunity here to do something more than just make a great book, make, tell a great story. Perhaps in some ways we can right a wrong. Um, we can say that it is okay now to be a comic book fan. You don't have to hide. You don't have to be embarrassed. A member of Congress did it. <laughs> At least something came out of there. <laughs> anyway. Well, and... Uh well, one of your, your colleagues, uh, Patrick Lay, he actually used the book and held it up. I, I hope he actually bought the copy. <laughs> uh, um, well, he, he did say he was going to make the uh, copy available to all of his uh, grandchildren. So uh, we didn't pass any copies on to him. <laughs> so I'm sure he went out and, 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 you know, I think Andrew is failing to tell the story how uh, the, the whole idea or doing this book, and I think that's important. Um, you know, going off to Comic Con, 
you maybe yeah, don't want right. to tell it, maybe no. it's just too embarrassed. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> no, um, so it was 2008 on the campaign. Uh, it was my first campaign ever. I was 24 years old. Um, I, I didn't know very much. Um, I, I, I was just figuring out myself. But um, it got to the end of the campaign, and, and we started talking about what we were going to do afterwards. Um, and everybody's like, I'm going to go to the beach. I'm going to go see my mom. I'm going to go see my girlfriend. And I said, I'm going to go to a Comic-Con. <laughs> and everybody looked at me like, OK, so <laughs> you're that guy. Um, and I was unashamed. I, I was fine with it. you know. And, and the, the congressman turned around and said, don't laugh. There was a comic book during the movement. And it was incredibly influential. And that sort of, that sort of boggled my mind. It was, it was really one of those moments where lightning strikes. You start thinking, and you're like, you know, you should write a comic book. <laughs> because that comic book was called Martin Luther King and the Montgomery Story. It was published December of 1957, but really distributed in 1958. Um, and, and Martin Luther King actually helped edit it. He offered some small suggestions on the script and things like that that were, um, I, I mean, I think I changed my perspective of Dr. King, right? You know, I mean, he's, he, we see him in this grand, this, this beautiful statue, and, and we see him on, on the, um, sort of with the halo, right? But I'm just imagining this guy reading a comic book script. You know, oh, uh, he, was it E.B. Nixon, I think? He did. E.B. Nixon. Nixon? Um, changed the dialogue a little bit, you know, marked through that, right? <laughs> Felt certain kinship. Um, and then that comic book goes on to be uh, something that inspires uh, folks in Nashville, uh, there were protests in the Midwest that Lawson, Jim Lawson, who is a field secretary for the Fellowship of Reconciliation, the organization that published the comic book, um, there were protests out there. Uh, all, all of these, these things started happening in 58 and 59 once the comic book was put out there, right? And uh, by, by, by January of 1960, the comic book had gotten to Greensboro, North Carolina, and into the hands of um, uh, Azel Blair and Joseph McNeil, two of the, what would become known as the Greensboro Four. And when they showed it to each other and they read it and they had that aha moment of, we should have a boycott. We should have a protest. They went and they sat in at the Woolworths lunch counter in Greensboro on February 1st, 1960, and that is the flashpoint that we look at now as the start of the sit-in movement, where, from which you saw SNCC emerge and these student leaders emerge um, that then shaped the politics for the next generation. And for me, being a fan of the X-Men comics and you know, Flash and Mike Wierengo's run back then and things like that, it, it seemed so amazing to me that it could have that potential, that, that really, that this had happened in our history and that nobody had told this story, right? Um, it's mentioned briefly in the congressman's book, it's mentioned in a few other places from the Fellowship of Reconciliation, but largely history had ignored this fact until Dalia Zieda goes and dredges up the comic book and publishes it in Arabic and Farsi in 2006-07, then takes it to, to Egypt and distributes it in Tahrir Square in the days and weeks leading up to the revolution in 2011. So here you see nearly 50 years of a comic book inspiring revolution of inspiring, more importantly, nonviolent protest, right? We see violence all over in our communities, on the news. We're contemplating violence in Syria. We're contemplating, we're dealing with the violence that's going on there um, everywhere. And yet, here you had an example of a comic book inspiring a nonviolent protest in places all over the world. In fact, once we got into digging, I did my graduate research on this, if that's wondering why, <laughs> why I'm getting a little intense on this. Uh, we, it showed up, not just there, but it showed up in uh, uh, South Africa, and then it was banned for being incendiary, right? There's no violence in this comic book, but yet they're still banning it down there. There's something about comic books and people liking to ban them. Um, Southern California. Southern California and, and, and uh, a part of the workers' rights movement. It showed up in Uruguay uh, and used throughout South America. Um, it was incredibly meaningful. So all of that comes together, and I just can't stop asking John Lewis to write a comic book. <laughs> <laughs> and so here we are five years later. I mean, you want to talk about taking your career and going all in. <laughs> That's what I did. So I'm really glad it's doing well. <laughs> I, I, I appreciate it. Thank you. Um, thank you.
Now, Congressman, I did want to ask, because um, this comes up in your book, um, and it comes up in other uh, sources, though it, it's not really part of what we're taught in general. But, well, when you started in the movement, you were very young. Um, David Halberstam's book about the Nashville student movement is called The Children. Yes. Um, and you talk in your book about how there was a great deal of tension between you and your, your peers and the older generation of people, uh, people like Thurgood Marshall um, and others who also did not, also believed in nonviolence, but they had a very different approach to it. And I, I wonder if you could just talk a little about what that was and, and what it meant to be young and to think about that. Well, I was very, very young um, when I first heard of Rosa Parks and Martin Luther King Jr. 15 years old in the 10th grade. But growing up there, I, I saw segregation and racial discrimination. I didn't like it. I didn't like the signs that said white waiting, colored waiting, white men, colored men, white women, colored women. Uh, I wanted to do something about it, but I didn't know what to do. And I saw what Dr. King was doing was the way, the way out, or maybe the way in. I heard his voice, listened to his words on old radio. I read about him, and in 1957, at the age of 17, I met Rosa Parks. The next year, 1958, I met Martin Luther King Jr. And I wanted to attend a little school called Troy State College, only 10 miles from my home. And applied to go there, but I never heard a word from the school. So I wrote Dr. King a letter. I didn't tell my mother, my father, and my sister, my brothers, and we bring all this out in, in book one, March book one. And Dr. King invited me to come to Montgomery to meet with him, and on a Saturday morning, my father drove me to the Greyhound bus station. I boarded the bus and traveled to 50 miles from Troy to Montgomery, and he sent a young lawyer uh, who had been a lawyer for Rosa Parks and Dr. King, and later became our lawyer during the Freedom Riots and the march from Selma to Montgomery, met me and drove me to a church, passed by his colleague, the Reverend Ralph Abernathy, and ushered me into the pastor's study. And I was so scared, I didn't know what to say or what to do. When I saw Martin Luther King Jr. and Reverend Ralph Abernathy standing behind the desk, and Dr. King said, are you the boy from Troy? Are you John Lewis? And I said, Dr. King, I am John Robert Lewis. <laughs> I gave my whole name. And he started calling me the boy from Troy. <laughs> and at that moment, I made a commitment that I would uh, do everything I possibly could in a peaceful, nonviolent fashion to bring down segregation and racial discrimination in the American South. And from time to time during the sit-ins and, and, and during the freedom rides, we would get arrested, we would go to jail. And I remember after returning from being in jail in Mississippi during the summer of 1961 for about 40 days, going to a conference on the campus of Fish University and Thurgood Marshall was there. And Mr. Marshall, like President Johnson, was very well known for choosing some very uh, colorful words. <laughs> and he called, it, called us everything but a child of God. He said, uh, you, what, whatever, uh, you got to stop doing those uh, sit-ins and freedom rides. Why go and get arrested and go to jail, get your brains knocked out and uh, let us take one case to the Supreme Court. And I said, Mr. Marshall, uh, we just can't have a few lawyers involved. We need a mass movement. So that's why we have the sit-ins. That's why we have the freedom rides. And we, we had this sense of now. And by 1963, the NACP had a slogan saying, free by 63. And there were young students from Africa 
attending many of the black colleges and campuses in the South, and they would joke with us from time to time and said the whole of Africa would be free and liberated and we wouldn't be, wouldn't be able to get a hamburger and a Coke at a lunch counter. <laughs> so we, we didn't like that. So we uh, continued to push and, and pull. And the first time I got arrested and went to jail, and I've been told over and over again by my mother and my father and my grandparents, don't get in trouble, don't get in trouble. But when I got arrested for sitting in in an orderly, peaceful, nonviolent fashion, I felt like I was getting in trouble. But I call it good trouble, necessary trouble. But I felt free and I felt liberated. I felt like I had crossed over and there was no turning back. When I spoke at the March on Washington on August 28, 1963, 50 years ago, I remember a line in my speech that said, you tell us to wait. You tell us to be patient. We cannot wait. We cannot be patient. We want our freedom and we want it now. And that's what the young people during those days were saying. And there were there was high school students, not just college students. And in Birmingham, there was elementary school and middle school students getting arrested and going to jail for what they believed in. Well, and of course, uh, tomorrow marks the 50th anniversary of another uh, major event of that era, uh, the bombing of the 16th Street Baptist Church in Birmingham, uh, okay. where four young girls were killed. I was just in Birmingham uh, Thursday night and all day yesterday and came back to Washington last night. I was there for part of the commemoration effort and 50 years ago uh, I traveled from Shore, Alabama from where I grew up to Birmingham and got there a few hours after the church was bombed. And being there with several of my colleagues from the Congress uh, yesterday and participating on the panel, uh, I just kept saying to myself, it's hard and difficult to believe that 50 years ago or uh, any time People would be so mean and so vicious or so sick to bomb a church on a Sunday morning, knowing the church is full with people to take the life of four young girls. But back in during the during the late fifties and the sixties, it was not only the bombing of churches, but homes, Birmingham, there were so many bombings, they call it Bombingham. But it was churches and it was synagogues that was born in parts of the South um, during the late 50s and during the 60s. Now, y you mentioned uh, African students who were in the South, and you actually cited uh, in your speech in 63, uh, the, in the march, you talked about the, the slogan that Africans, the African uh, liberation movements used. Well, while I was working on, on that speech for August 28, 1963, have been uh, reading a copy of the New York Times, and I saw a group of black women in Southern Africa carrying signs saying, one man, one vote. So in my March on Washington speech, I said something like, one man, one vote is the African cry. It is ours too, it must be ours. The young people in the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee took the position that the only qualification for being able to register to vote should be that of age and residence. But in many parts of the South, people said you had a rule. You had to pass a so-called literature test. On one occasion, a man in Alabama was asked to count the number of bubbles in a bar of soap or the number of jelly beans in a jar. There were African-American lawyers, doctors, teachers, college professors were told they could not read or write well enough. So that's why hundreds of students came from all over America in 63, 64, and 65 to work in the South, uh, in Mississippi, in Alabama, in Georgia, and other parts to encourage people to pass their so-called literacy tests uh, so they could attempt to register to vote. But the literacy test on poll taxes was, was a device to make it hard and difficult for people to register to vote. If I can put a little context on that, they, at the, after the speech at the March on Washington, Jet Magazine um, called John Lewis the young militant for taking such a position. 
that says something about the distance traveled, right? That the, 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 the requirement to have age and, and citizenship as the qualification to vote, right, was such a leap that, that, that he became known as a militant. And so today, when we look at these positions that some people take, and they say, you know, you're so far out there, you're, you, you have to look at the long, hard look, the, the long arc of history to see where these positions will be 50 years from now. We're always going to be moving forward as a society if everybody keeps working. I just think that's worth noting. Now, one thing I was wondering, um, I know you spent, you were, you went to Africa in 64, 65? 64. 64. Um, and you went there for uh, some of the, the independence celebrations. Um, and while you were there, you met Malcolm X. It, uh, during the fall, it was after the Democratic Convention in Atlanta City in 1964, um, Harry Belafonte uh, raised enough money to put 10 people from the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee to travel to Africa. And uh, we made uh, stops in several countries. We ended up in, uh, two of us, in Nairobi, in Kenya. And we were staying at the hotel, a British hotel, well-known, the New Stanley Hotel. And Malcolm was staying in the same hotel. He had missed his flight. We were on our way down to Zambia for the independence celebration. And we had an opportunity to spend about two days with him. Uh, having a meal, having breakfast, a lunch, a dinner in the, in the same dining room. And he had returned from Mecca and he wanted to become identified with the movement. He kept on saying, I wanna come stop to help you all. Uh, I had first met him the night before the March on Washington. He was at the Capitol Hilton Hotel at 16th and K in Washington where most of us stayed the night before the march but I didn't have an opportunity really to just say hello to him. But we had an opportunity to say, well, you should come, you should come. And so during the Selma movement, he came to Selma uh, to meet with Dr. King, to meet the rest of us, and we were all in jail in Selma. And the local official refused to let him come to the jail to visit us. And he came to Selma on February the 14th, 1965, and spoke at a church full of high school students with Mrs. Martin Luther King Jr. That was, uh, and seven days later, he was assassinated in New York City on February the 21st. Now, Andrew, Nate, do you guys want to talk a little about what goes on in March Book Two? I mean, Nate, I know you're. I don't know what the phrase, neck deep phrase. Well, keep asking good these questions. Words. You're going to give away the next two books. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, I mean, basically, the, the nuts and bolts of the script for the entire trilogy is done. But once we worked up um, a complete enough creative rapport with book one, uh, basically, finally, by the end of book one, we knew exactly how we were working best together. So uh, they're working out some, some tweaks and uh, some structural changes with the rest of the trilogy, but I've got book two thumbnailed, penciled, or I'm, I'm in the process of penciling it. But uh, it basically run, the, the major topics covered in it are the Freedom Rides themselves, uh, sort of climaxing with the town Parchment Farm in Mississippi, uh, then moving uh, towards and including the March on Washington itself uh, which butts right up against the bombing of 16th Street uh, Baptist Church in Birmingham. Uh, and that sort of uh, is woven into uh, the 2009 narrative arc involving President Obama's uh, first inaugural day. Uh, and both with, uh, with speeches that are delivered from 60, 61, 62, 63 in 2009, uh, you know, we, we do our best to provide as many interweavings and parallels, um, but yeah, I mean, book two is incredibly dark and brutal uh, compared to book one. And so, um, you know, I feel like one of the major, you know, one of the major 
themes uh, or, or overriding questions in book two is, uh, you know, being able to simultaneously consider how far we have come as a society between 63 and 2009 and, uh, you know, seeing how that's a piece of the puzzle of how far we have to go. So um, it's, it, it is going to be very interesting in terms of like the sheer amount of, relatively speaking, the sheer amount of brutality that's in book two, uh, especially as, as this trilogy continues to have a, you know, a much, much broader audience and potential you know, with, its, with its scope and its scale. Uh, we'll see how that goes down. Uh, but those are the two major points from the movement that are covered in book two. Because, I mean, uh, 60, the events of 63, um, and we like to think of the march, but um, everything else, the, the bombings. Birmingham. I mean, you can't tell the story without Birmingham. Um, and there's pieces in there, too, that are, um, you know, I think people look at the march on Washington and the abstract, like it's sort of this standalone event, and then only recently, uh, as we talk about it here and, and elsewhere, we started to go back and look at the events that led up to it. And I think people also fail to connect the dots between, you know, the campaign in Birmingham, um, and then how that led into both John Lewis becoming chairman of SNCC, and its timing and correlation with these other events, um, and, and then ultimately the March on Washington and how these big six leaders came to be. Um, because each one of them represented their own organization, right? I mean, you've got CORE, the NAACP, the Urban League, SCLC. Um, everybody's got uh, a constituency that they're fighting for and that was playing a unique role. And so part of what we try to do is to give that broader context um, that is sort of a unique opportunity when you put it in the eyes of, of John Lewis. Um, because, you know, I mean, I mean, I look at it this way, is that we see so many, and this was my personal attraction to this, is that we see these stories that are done in lights. And you see it in front of the cameras and the podiums. But when you turn that around, and I, I think we only really get a glimpse of it in, in book one, but in book two it's gonna get even deeper into the, the personal story of so many of these people and how, you know, like we're saying about putting the new context on, on Dr. King, but putting a context on all these people, who was scared, who kind of talked too much, who, you know, I mean, these personal things that you know when you're in the room with somebody, but then you, you learn the history of it, and the history says he was a great man, period. Um, these are individuals. And, and for us, looking at our own lives today and, and what we want to do, you know, we look around the room and we're like, okay, these are not, you know, this may not be the person who's ready to lead us or something like that. But we need, to, we need to, first of all, respect the dignity and worth of every human being and then look at them as these individuals whose characteristics define their, their style. Um, and then hopefully you'll see that there are these same issues, problems, that these were normal people fighting and struggling uh, to, to, to undergo and, and to live through this, mo this movement and this revolution. And for, for many of us, uh, you know, these were people who are our age now or younger, uh, which to me is, like, you know, working on the book every day. That's the thing that sort of gives me pause every couple of days when I'm, you know, doing my photo reference or whatever, and you know, getting a likeness, and all of a sudden it'll hit me that I'm drawing a 21-year-old, uh, or I'm drawing a 30-year-old, uh, and that I'm out aging all of these people. But yeah, I'm in in the abstract, you know, like you can be very well versed in history, and that. That simple fact, as far as you know, the the youthful energy, uh, the vitality of the movement, that's something that, that always you know, slips by too. I think it's very easy to slip by. Well, I was going to say, I mean, my my one criticism of, of book one, which is not really a criticism, um, is that it because it ends per it ends at just the right moment, but it represents how a lot of people like to think the civil rights movement was. It, it, it was ugly, it was uncomfortable, but it was not ugly in a way of bombing a church on a Sunday morning, on beating people in the streets, on sicking dogs on children. Um. Well, but that's a give and take, right? So they make this step forward, tactically. Right, looking at it in the abstract as a tactics, uh, as a tactical movement, 
you make the uh, uh, the forward movement of attacking the lunch counters, right? You're going to make one step forward. Then comes in book two, and you'll see this vigorously, the, the counter reaction. You know, um, there's some early scenes in, in book two uh, at Crystal's where this is, this is just months after uh, the book one ends. And um, Bernard... And Young man by the name of Bernard, Bernard Lafayette, who was a, who was a member of the National Student mm -hmm. Movement. Um, they're, they're organizing these protests, and then the, the owner of the store actually turns a fumigator on them, locks the doors, and fumigates the restaurant to try and kill these people. And, and that's, that's how you, like, I mean, f as, as a storyteller, it's a way of introducing to you that to the violence. To kill this dude. <laughs> right. Uh, and who was with you? Yeah. It was Fred Gray, right? Yeah. Uh, or no, no, I'm sorry. Yeah, uh, Fred. Fred Fred Leonard. Leonard. Um, as a storyteller, it, it introduces the story as the escalating violence. Okay? But on the flip side, um, that was the natural reaction from a society under siege. Their, their, their customs were under siege, right? Their, their privilege was under siege. And so you then see, as soon as we start the next book, the unbelievable violence that comes in reaction to the small victory. I mean, the ability to eat at a lunch counter, we treat this as like a major victory, but in reality now, we think nothing of it, you know? But it took so much hard work and sacrifice and discipline to get there. And then the counterpoint to that is then, okay, well, we will try and kill you. But to, give, to, to give an example, the attorney was a highly respected Nashville attorney mm -hmm. named Z. Alexander Luby. He was one of the first uh, African American to be elected to what they call the board of aldermen, or maybe a city council. Uh, today, he was one of the most respected uh, citizen of the city of Nashville. But a group of lawyers, African American lawyer, made a decision to defend all of us, 89 of us who have been arrested in jail, uh, for just sitting in at a lunch counter and an orderly, take this, this is the lunch counter. Black and white students are sitting here together. Woolworth store. Some of us are reading a book, a paper. Some of us may be writing a paper. And some of us may be just looking straight ahead, waiting to be served. And someone will come up and spit on you, put a lighted cigarette out in your hair, or down your back or start pulling you off the lunch counter stool. And the police officers would come in and arrest all of us, 89 of us, would be arrested and taken to jail. And during the time while we were negotiating the larger community with the merchants and the business people, and we seized the protests for about three weeks, we all came out of jail. The attorney home was bombed. This man whom he barely, along with his wife, barely escaped death. And the Nashville community didn't like it. The black citizen, the white citizen didn't like the bombing of this man whom. And later that day, when we heard about the bombing, the Nashville student group met and said we would march on City Hall and more than 4,000 students, black and white, walked in an orderly, peaceful, nonviolent fashion. We had sent a telegram to the mayor, said meet us at noon. And it was the mayor of the city who met us, steps of city hall, and one of the young lady who's on the cover of uh, Nate does a great job in, in, if you have your book, you can see her right on, on, the, on the cover. And she asked the mayor, said, Mr. Mayor, do you favor desegregation of the lunch counters? And he said, uh, she said, do you think it's right for business people to invite you into a store and then deny you service? Do you favor desegregation of the lunch counter? And the mayor said, young lady, I do favor the integration of the lunch counter. 
And the next day, the Nashville, Tennessee, and had it as the headline. And for a few more days, we negotiated. And most of the lunch counters in downtown Nashville desegregated. Became the first major city in the South to desegregate this lunch counter. But it took action, it took drama. And Andrew and Nader Wright, when you move on to book two, book three, it's going to be a lot of drama. <laughs> a lot of drama. Some of us almost died in that same church where I met Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. If it hadn't been for President Kennedy and Attorney General Robert Kennedy, people tried to bomb the church, tried to burn the church down. There's more than 1,500 people in the church there in support of the Freedom Riders. It was the President of the United States who placed the city of Montgomery under martial law and federalized the Alabama National Guard. Well, Congressman, I think uh, Andrew made the point earlier that comics have always been trouble. Trouble. <laughs> and you've been getting in trouble all your life. And uh, well, on behalf of, of all of us, thank you for getting into trouble. And on behalf of comics, thank you for joining us and causing some trouble. Thank you.